Welcome back. So I know that some of you have already went through the slideshow a little bit earlier and have already submitted the assignment for today. I really appreciate that. I'm glad that you're getting onto it early. Uh, I just kind of ran into some problems because I don't have an internal mic, so I needed to buy an external mic. So I went out and got me one right here. Uh, pretty snazzy. I like it. I feel like I should do like a deep radio voice. I don't know, something like that. Uh, either way, um, so I'm getting to this a little bit later than I anticipated, um, but let's go ahead and check it out. The first voyage of Christopher Columbus. Now, I'm going to go ahead and give you somewhat of a, a precursor. Um, you know, I I have probably done more study on Christopher Columbus, more research, more reading in the past three, four weeks than I have done over the course of my lifetime. Um, there's a lot of controversy surrounding Columbus. We're 500 plus years removed from his discovery, whether it was, you know, the discovery he thought he had made or not. You know, we're 500 years removed, but Columbus's name still sparks so much controversy. Now, I'm not here to tell you that you should think this, that you should think that, because at the end of the day, I want you to make your own decisions. But with that being said, I, I personally, the reason I think Columbus is so controversial is because it's so much easier to throw him into one category. Either he's bad or he's good. He did great things or he did terrible things. It's easier just to throw him in one category than to look at him through the lens of someone that is capable of doing both good and evil. Maybe this is a little bit more philosophical and maybe something I should talk about, you know, that I will end up talking about with my philosophy class, but it very much rings true here. Uh, human beings are both capable of doing very good things and very bad things. I feel like my, sorry, I feel like my, uh, my video is lagging a little bit, <clears throat> but again, people are, are, are capable of both. And so we're going to see some good things and some bad. But when you try to put it into one strict narrative sense, uh, it's where you're going to run into trouble because it's a lot more complicated than what we've ever been taught. I hope to teach you a little bit more about Columbus, uh, some things you didn't already know, or maybe even some things that you did know, but just not to that extent. So let's go ahead and check out our presentation on Christopher Columbus and his first voyage. All right, so let's get this pulled up. All right, it's been a little slow. Maybe I should already had this pulled up, but I wanted to give you, you know, a little bit of the outline, and plus you can see how many tabs I have open at a single time. Maybe that's why my computer runs a little bit slower than it probably should. There we go. So the first voyage of Christopher Columbus. All right, let's 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 go ahead and jump right in. Okay, so let's review. <clears throat> I said let's jump right in, and then we need to review. I forgot I put this in there. All right, let me move my face. There we go, right in the middle, right in the middle. All right, so let's review. So Columbus believed he knew of a quicker route to Asia by sailing westward. Again, he was not the only person that thought this, but this was a very revolutionary idea. And it was so revolutionary that the forefront, the leaders of innovation, the leaders of exploration in Portugal wouldn't even sponsor his voyage. So what did they do? They sent him on his way. He ends up going to Spain. Spain agrees to sponsor Columbus's voyage if he can do three things. If he can find gold and bring it back, 1G. If he can spread the word of God, 2G, and help convert others to Christianity. And 3G, bring glory to Spain. The first two are really tangible, like measurable, uh, you know, terms, I guess, you know, for lack of a better word. So the first two are tangible, like you can measure them. Like he can bring back gold in pounds and, you know, whatever, and they can weigh that out. That is something they can touch, they can see, they can feel. And with spreading the word of Christianity and converting others to Christianity, uh, you can see that, again, measurably in terms of people's moral practices, people, uh, who, what they worship, how they worship. Again, that's something that you can see and something that you can feel. But bringing glory to Spain is something that is a little bit more intangible, something that can't necessarily be measured, but it can bring influence. 
That's what countries want. That's what leaders want. They want influence, to influence others to do as they please. It's, it's almost a sense of persuasion when you have a lot of influence. So these are the reasons that Columbus is sponsored by Spain. So let's see what happens when Columbus gets the green light. So we look at our we look at our next. Oh, I'm toggling myself. There we go. So setting sail. So on August 3rd, we're talking August 3rd, 1492, Columbus and Company. Uh, that's not like uh, that's not like what he calls himself. That was just what I put together. Columbus and Company deport from Palos, Spain, with three boarded ships. So <clears throat> the the names of, the, of these ships are the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, which was Columbus's favorite. But they're not the exact names of them. The Santa Maria is uh, the Nina was nicknamed, and the Pinta it, it kind of goes back and forth as to what the official name of that is. But again. For clarity's sake, it's easier just to think of this as the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. But in actuality, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> the Nina and the Pinta were piloted by the Pinzon brothers. Uh, I want to say it's Martin Alonso and Vicente. Uh, I can't think of his middle name, but uh, but, but the Pinzon brothers. They were very accomplished sailors in their own right and were explorers. And they are going to... Uh, they are going to captain both the Nina and the Pinta, and Columbus himself is going to captain the Santa Maria and is going to be in charge of this entire voyage. But Columbus needed a couple other captains with him uh, to take the other ships. So they actually, again, well, excuse me, they leave on August 3rd, and they actually run into some issue right off the bat. Uh, their idea was to sail south, to the Canary Islands, which are right off the coast of Africa. That was their plan all along, but they actually have to stop there because the rudder to one of the ships, uh, it is the uh, Pinta, that was already damaged. So they had to go and fix one of the ships before they could make this long voyage. Now, this wasn't the only reason they stopped, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> this wasn't the only reason that they stopped in the Canary Islands. The other reason they stopped in the Canary Islands is because they knew that by the maps that they already had, they knew that if they sailed south to the Canary Islands, then they could sail directly westward and would not have to worry about north and south because where they were wanting to go, the Indies were along the same latitude lines. So this would make their navigation a lot, a lot less messy. They wouldn't have to worry, again, about getting too far north, too far south, as long as they stay west. That made it Again, they had compasses, they had uh, instruments called sextants that they would use to measure the sun, and they would also use the North Star as a navigation tool. But this was Columbus's idea to make the voyage as simple as he possibly could, because there was a lot of unknown here. No one knew how big the Atlantic Ocean was. No one knew how far it went, if it went forever. I mean, I, I mean again, like they knew that the world was round, but they didn't know exactly when you I don't know if you've been out in the middle of the ocean, but if you go out in the middle of the ocean, you can't see anything around you. That's kind of a scary thought. You know, that's why, uh, you know, like sailors, like they, you know, that's a, that's a tough, that's a tough position, especially like in the military, like being on a submarine. Like these guys are so outside of the normal scope of life that, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's unimaginable how that doesn't drive you crazy. But we're going to see how it does drive some of Columbus's men crazy. So we're going to run into some issues. I'm running into an issue right now because I can't get this. Dag um. There we go. All right, we're going to run into some issues. There are going to be some problems at sea. Uh, here, here's some of the problems. It all starts with the crew. Most of the problems that Columbus is going to have on this journey is with the crew members. First, much of the crew was not experienced in sailing. So <clears throat> this, is, this is kind of a wild thought. And again, it makes the story so much more complicated than we're typically, you know, than we're ever taught. So not only is Columbus's crew inexperienced, uh, in 
in large regard, they're forced to even be on this to begin with. So the city of Palos was a troublesome city in the eyes of the king and queen, King Ferdinand, Queen Isabella. It was a troublesome city. And so what the king and queen decided to do is they decided to make, to force Palos um, provide two ships in addition to the Santa Maria for Columbus's voyage. And the crew would, the, the crew, to, it, being a crew member was essentially punishment for the misdemeanors they had committed against the crown. Again, this was their way of justice towards Palos, is making them pay for the ships and find crew and to load the ships and to take this again this voyage that again seemed impossible or if not impossible improbable criminals because again there were you know, this was a a punishment given to Paulus criminals were actually promised the suspension of their imprisonment so that if they went on this voyage with Columbus, they would get rid of their prison sentence, the king and queen would, if they volunteered to be part of it. Now, you would think that that would have, that the entire crew would be made up of criminals, but this tells you something about how improbable the success of this journey was. Four, four prisoners sign up to take this voyage. I want you to think about that for a second. Let's say that you've committed some great crime and and you know that you've committed this great crime and you know that you'll never see the light of day but uh, you've changed you're, you're such a you're such a better person now you've come to understand your mistakes and you just want a second chance at life and you're and you have the opportunity to get out you have the opportunity to to, to, to have a get out, get out of jail free card to wipe the slate clean. The only thing you have to do is accompany and be a part of a crew taking people across the Atlantic Ocean and into Asia, following Columbus's revolutionary idea. That's what you have to do. Maybe you're gone for six months. Maybe you're gone for a year. But at the end of that year, you'll be right. You'll be you'll be back to normal life. Four prisoners in Palos agree to this. Four. That's it. The rest of Columbus's his crew would be fishermen, simple fishermen that just knew a little bit about sailing, uh, cargo traders that the Pinzon brothers were able to actually convince to be a part of this crew, and, um, and just several that just wanted to be a part of an adventure. Because again, whoever, if this was doable and if it was accomplished, this would bring glory not just to the king and queen of Spain, but individually and definitely to the city of Palos. So again, the Pinzon brothers are able to convince a lot of Palos to jump on board these crews, even though it does seem improbable. And I believe that shows that from the amount of prisoners, the four prisoners that are the only ones to sign up for this. But the ones that do, you know, volunteer to be a part of this crew, they uh, they don't know exactly what it entails, but they know they want to be a part of something bigger. Now, when Columbus and his men, um, including the Pizon brothers, when they get out to sea, Columbus notes that they are very discouraged. Let me move my face. He notes that they're very discouraged. <clears throat> he writes this in his journal, and they're becoming more and more restless as the voyage continues. Columbus, he actually does something in the beginning of his voyage that he continues um, in spurts throughout the rest of the journey, is that he tells the crew that they haven't traveled as far as they actually had. Now, why would you do this? Wouldn't you want to give your crew good news? Well, Columbus, his line of thinking was that um, you know, they, they, he talks in nautical terms, and I'm not, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a fisherman or deep sea fisherman. I'm not a, uh, you know, I'm not a sailor or a captain. So the nautical language, a little beyond me. Um, but he talks about traveling in leagues, and league is a certain amount of distance. But 
if they traveled like 20 leagues, he would tell them that they had only actually tra traveled 15 leagues. Instead of giving them the good news that they had traveled, you know, that certain distance, he doesn't want them to uh, expect more than what they might get. So he tells them 15 so they know that you know, this is going to be a long journey. They know this is going to be a long journey. And if he tells them 15 when they're actually traveling 20, then maybe they'll get there a little bit sooner than what they expect, or at least what the crew expects. Columbus holds this information from them because, again, he knows that he has a lot of people on this sh on these ships that are not necessarily like huge fans of him or are doing this because they think he's some type of genius. They're doing so because it offers opportunity for themselves. All right, so those are a couple problems. Let's look at a couple more. So not only is the crew inexperienced and discouraged, but they're also having issues with their measurement tools. So <clears throat> the compass had been around for some time, but it wasn't it wasn't like foolproof. Um, and there is a phenomenon known as uh, magnetic declination, which causes their compass to be off by several degrees. What it does is it takes uh, true north and aligns it to magnetic north. Now, again, this is more of a problem with navigation but what this does is it takes the um, the accuracy it, it it makes it off by several degrees and that's going to be a big deal especially the longer that this you know this journey is going to be the more that these little mistakes will have large ramifications um, they actually decide uh, along Columbus along with the Pizon brothers they actually decide to kind of alter their course a little bit after they realize that their sorry my phone was ringing that they realized that their path had kind of gotten off kilter they actually decide to alter it a little bit if they would not have columbus may have landed in what is now modern day florida but with that not being the case uh he's going to land a little bit southward of florida um, because of these issues with the compass many of columbus's men begin to think they're lost at sea and you can see and you can understand this because again if you are out in the middle of the ocean and you have not seen land you have not seen any people other than you know the ones that are on board with you and the ones in the accompanying ships if you haven't seen this for four or five weeks which is somebody was mowing right outside my door uh, for four or five weeks, again, you start to go stir crazy and they begin to think they are lost at sea. And if you are lost at sea, the odds of you returning to, you know, to land or returning back to Spain uh, is, is not very favorable. You know, they were lucky in that first journey that they had pretty good weather the whole time. But if they, if they waited, again, they are in October at this point. Um, if they wait, then they're going to be in the dead of winter, and you do not. And they did not want to be in the dead of winter, throughout in the Atlantic Ocean, having to travel back to Spain. This was going to be an even more dangerous voyage. If they can even figure out where they were, think about it. They could be spinning in circles in the ocean, or just going the wrong directions, or not going far enough, and never finding land again. So you can see how these issues with the navigation are having a large impact on the psychological stance of these crew members and Columbus himself, which takes us to number four. Number four. Columbus's journey. <laughs> this, is, this is wild. Columbus's journey almost met a fatal end less than two days before his you know, magnificent discovery or the, you know, the, the biggest discovery of at least the past 500, 600 years, if not the biggest discovery in, oh, my battery's low, if not the biggest discovery in, um, I got to plug this up, in world history. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, he is a astrophysicist. I was watching a um, interview with him uh, during a podcast, and he was saying how he believed this to be the greatest discovery in human history because it t took two separate parts of the world that had never um, been joined together and connected them. And when you think about that, I mean, it, it's what can you compare that to? I mean, there's not much. There's a couple, but there's not much you can really compare 
the magnitude of that discovery too. But let's look at our last one, and that is an attempted mutiny. So I gave you a definition here because the word mutiny um, you might think of as like mutants, like X-Men. Uh, I actually heard this term for the first time when I watched Pirates of the Caribbean, Curse of the Black Pearl. You start hearing about mutiny with Captain Jack Sparrow. And what this means is that it is a rebellion against authority. And this is typical among sailors, as in they will overthrow the captain because of his decisions. And this is something that was so close to happening on Columbus's first voyage that he had to kind of talk his way out of it. Uh, the crew began to distrust Columbus because... Again, they had been out to sea for, they had left Palos August 3rd. They, had, they ran into trouble very early and had to stop in the Canary Islands. They set stuff in the Canary Islands, and it's been 34 days at this point, and they have not seen land at all. And again, Columbus believed the world was smaller uh, than what most people thought. So he thought this you know, wouldn't be near as long. Maybe two weeks is what they had in mind. And now it's been... 34 days, 34 days, that's almost five weeks. The crew wants to turn back. They tell Columbus that they want to turn back um, on October 10th. On October 10th, the crew was willing to overthrow Columbus, and Columbus has to reason with them. Columbus has to put, think about, think about how, put yourself in, the, in this position. So, Columbus is at the mercy of his crew at this point because they want to get rid of him. Who knows what that means, whether that means overthrowing him and forcing him to take them back because he is, again, one of the, one of the three captains. Maybe they would have killed him. Uh, maybe they would have thrown him overboard. Who knows? But they want to turn back. This is on, excuse me, I, I might have said August. This is on October 10th. And Columbus has to think about this for a little bit. And he tells his crew, after consideration, that they just need to give him three more days. Just give him three more days. And if they haven't found land in three days, they'll turn back. Columbus was willing, for those three days, to give up everything that he had gotten so far. Again, he had convinced the king and queen of Spain to sponsor this journey. He had gotten three ships. He had gotten crew, even though they weren't the best, you know, most experienced crew. He still had a crew. They had been going along the Atlantic Ocean for 35 days after they left the Canary Islands. This is the farthest that anyone had gotten. And the farthest that Columbus ever thought that he probably would ever be able to get. He didn't have anything to give back to the king and queen. He didn't find, he didn't, you know, he didn't find, he hadn't found land yet. So he hadn't got, he hadn't discovered any gold and be able to harvest that gold and take it back as payment. He hadn't been able to spread the word of God and convert, you know, these natives that they were hoping to encounter to Christianity. He wasn't going to bring back any glory for Spain. If anything, he was going to make Spain an embarrassment. But three days is what he asked for. Three days. If he hasn't, if they haven't discovered land in three days, then he'll turn back. He's willing to give that up because he knows that if he isn't willing to give that up, then he may lose his life in the process. October 10th. October 10th. And on that second, on that second day, early, early in the morning, on October 12th, Columbus has a day to spare. At 2 a.m. in the morning, land is spotted ahead by one of the sailors on the Pinta. Now, this is just, uh, this is just, you can look at it as humorous, you can look at it as petty. Um, but Columbus had actually promised after, you know, on October 10th, when he told them that he just needed three more days, he told all of the sailors, not just on his ship, but on the other ships as well, that if whoever was to spot land first would be giving. A, uh, a large payment, a large payment. And this would be enough for essentially like a year's salary uh, for a sailor. But, uh, but Columbus would later claim the reward for himself uh, because he said that he saw a, a, a distant light in, you know, on the horizon. 
that would end up being that land. And he says that he saw it first. So that, uh, well, uh, kind of see it in different ways. Uh, if it wasn't for Columbus, they'd already turned back. Uh, so maybe he was just wanting to ensure that he was going to get some type of payment in the end because at this point he didn't know how willing his crew was going to be to follow him. And also this may have bought him a little bit more time. Maybe uh, if he wouldn't have promised that money, they he wouldn't have got that three days. So that is kind of a – it's an ironic portion of this story. Uh, Columbus believed – that the island that they were seeing and the island that they would officially land on was actually off the coast of Japan. That is what he thought uh, because the area that he was attempting to sail to was known as the Indies. Again, why were the natives called Indians? Not because Columbus thought he landed in India. This is another, This is again, this is another thing that we just get wrong about Columbus. He didn't think he was going to India. He thought he was going off the coast of Japan to the Indies. Today they are called the East Indies. And these islands that Columbus is actually settles on are today called the West Indies. It's crazy. Um, the islands that Columbus would officially land on, uh, it, they were not off the coast of Japan. Instead, they were in the Caribbean Sea, and they are known as the Bahamas uh, today. And the Dominican Republic, Haiti, uh Cuba is going to be one of the countries or one of the islands that he is going to travel to. This area, this area is where Columbus actually lands and where we will pick up in tomorrow's class. All right, see you then.